Today's talk is entitled Getting Ahead of the Evolving Landscape in Radio Pharmaceuticals. My name is Mira and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all listeners are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank MedPace who developed the content of this presentation. MedPace is a scientifically driven, global, full-service, clinical contract research organization providing phase one through four clinical development services to the biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and medical device industries. MedPace's mission is to accelerate the global development of safe and effective medical therapeutics through its high science and disciplined operating approach that leverages local regulatory and deep therapeutic expertise across all major areas, including oncology, radiology, metabol metabolic disease, endocrinology, central nervous system, and antiviral and anti-infective. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's events. Jess Garnashelli, MD, Medical Director, Radiation Oncology at MedPace. Alexia Doust, PhD, Imaging Project Manager at MedPace, MedPace Core Laboratories. Stephanie Millen, PhD, Cl Clinical Trial Manager at MedPace. Sanjay Gunasekara, PhD, PharmD, RPH, RAC, Senior Regulatory Affairs Associate at MedPace. And now without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to our speakers. They may begin when ready. So the role of radiopharmaceuticals in oncology has rapidly expanded in the last decades, particularly in the field of imaging for diagnosis, staging, and follow-up, as well as therapy. I will walk you through a capsule history of medical radiation and how we landed where we are today. Thank you, Henri Becquerel, 1896, for discovering naturally occurring radioactivity. Captain Bill Briner, the father of radiopharmacy, paved the way and laid the foundation for the practice of radiopharmaceuticals. He started the National Institute of Health Radiopharmacy in 1958. Then in 2017, we saw regulatory approval of lutetium-177 dotatate, and since then, radiopharmaceuticals really started to take off. Last year in 2019, we saw several launches, mergers, and acquisitions among radiopharmaceutical drug development and manufacturing companies, as well as strategic collaborations between radiopharmaceutical companies. There is a 5.4% predicted growth in radiopharmaceuticals up through the year 2024. In discussing radiopharmaceuticals for therapy, we are not talking about traditional drugs, and we're not talking about classic external beam radiation therapy. We're talking about administering a product that has a very short half-life, which quickly starts to decay. And if it becomes inert, it becomes ineffective without benefit to patients. The instability of radio-labeled compounds after administration is a major concern for clinicians. While the general radiobiological principles of external beam and radionuclide therapy are the same, the latter may be distinguished in terms of application of particular nature of radiation, energy, linear energy transfer for radioisotopes commonly used for radionuclide therapy are between 50 and 200 keV per micrometer for alpha particle emitters and 0.2 keV per micrometer for beta emitters. Unlike external beam radiation therapy, there is extended and declining radiation dose rates less than 0.5 gray per hour. There is non-uniform and relatively uncontrolled distribution of radioactivity through the body, which I will discuss in more depth in a later slide. 
And lastly, there may be undesired systemic absorbed dose to distant non-targeted organs, which may cause hematologic toxicities. However, the features that place radionuclide therapy as advantageous over external beam are that there is more easy targeting and treatment of tumor cells, especially those who have metastasized to critical organs. There is high linear energy transfer radionuclides that can more effectively kill radioresistant and hypoxic cells. <clears throat> there is a relatively lower whole body absorbed dose in most instances. And in this regard, the promising therapeutic effects of radionuclide therapy have been demonstrated for hematologic malignancies, so FDA approved Zevalin and Bexar for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Targeting mechanisms of radiopharmaceuticals. There are different approaches of targeted radionuclide therapy. Radionuclides can be targeted to various locations of the targeted cells. Membrane is most preferred site of targeting, which can be achieved through tumor-specific antibodies or peptides. Targeting can be further facilitated through liposomes or other types of nanoparticles. An uptake of radionuclides tagged with various carrier molecules either get endocytosed, or if the carrier is low molecular weight, it may easily diffuse inside of the cells. Liposomes have the ability to deliver its contents into the tumor cell cytoplasm through membrane fusion. Radionuclides can also be targeted to the nucleus either through CPP tagged antibody peptide or base analogs of DNA. Here is a brief review and sampling of current clinical uses of therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals. Iodine-131 has been used for follow-up and therapy of differentiated thyroid diseases for over half a century, and that experience forms the background for other targeted radionuclide therapy. Although it has been more than 50 years since the use of radioact radioactive strontium for treatment of bone metastases, radioactive strontium and samarium can be and have been used to treat painful um, and to palliate painful skeletal metastases. Other alternative routes to bring radioactivity in close contact with tumor cells include administration of radionuclides conjugated with peptides, antibodies, or encapsulated in liposomal nanoparticles. On the right of this slide is a, vid is a visual which demonstrates other administrative alternatives. Intracavitary radionuclide therapy can be applied to pleural, pericardial, or peritoneal, or intrathecally into the cerebral spinal fluid through an Omaya reservoir. Similar to other cancer radiotherapy modalities, efficacy of radionuclide therapy is governed by radiologic and radiobiologic principles as it is based on killing of the tumor cells by radiation emitted from the radionuclides. In radionuclide therapy, the net biologic effects exerted to tumor and normal cells needs to be understood during clinical trial scenarios. Radiation bystander effect provides an example of how non-targeted effects of ionizing radiation impacts unintended tissues adjacent to and distant from the actual tumor target. Compared to external beam radiation therapy, radionuclide therapy um, and radiobiologic implications differ. First, heterogeneity in cell dose distribution is more likely to occur because as you can see, localization of the radionuclide only goes to a fraction of the cells in the tumor tissue. Second, cells at the periphery of the tumor mass may receive a lethal dose of radiation, while those in the middle of the mass may receive minimal. You can see that there is a gradient of dose spanning over thousands of cell layers, so this is a complex phenomenon. Due to this gradient, some tumor cells may receive minimal dose and become radioresistant, creating a more likely scenario for cancer recurrence. Overall, a better radiobiologic understanding of concepts like bystander effect, adaptive response, and obscopal effects during radionuclide therapy will contribute to better therapeutic clinical trial strategy for improved treatment efficacy and limiting incidence of radiation side effects. Dr. Doust will touch upon the importance of radiation dosimetry in a moment. Dosimetry requires and deserves more attention to quantitate assessment of tumor dose and to account for radiation exposure of the normal tissues. 
From a MedPACE medical monitoring stance, it is of utmost importance that the entire study team understand the difference between radiation absorbed dose and radiation activity as they have differing SI units. And this should be common knowledge among a competent radiopharmaceutical study team. Lastly, the successful conduct of a complex radiopharmaceutical trial requires a multidisciplinary approach, which should not be regarded as competition with any other cancer treatment modality in finding its optimal place in the overall management of an oncology patient. The entire study team benefits from understanding the basic radiation oncology, clinical concepts, history, radiation biology, and dosimetry of radiopharmaceuticals. And as I lead into Dr. Guna Sakara's regulatory considerations, I will show recent FDA and EMA, not individual European countries, the approved radiopharmaceuticals that are currently on the market. Dr. Guna Sakara. Thank you, Chess. So in this section, I will talk about the regulatory frameworks that are in place in the US and EU to guide sponsors that are interested in developing radiopharmaceuticals. So broadly speaking, the take-home messages are going to be the following. First, although most major geographies will have a framework in place, what you may notice is that in general, that there's a lack of harmonization across these geographies. So sponsors need to consider the type of product, the intended use, and the risks that are associated with their product to identify the regulatory pathway that is applicable to them. Secondly, sponsors should also consider the regulations and guidances as applicable to the geographies of their interests. And finally, but perhaps most importantly, we encourage sponsors to engage with the regulatory authorities early in the development cycle to gain alignment on the clinical development plan. So let's start by taking a look at the U.S. regulatory framework. In the U.S., there are several agencies that have regulatory oversight of radiopharmaceuticals. A couple of them are listed here. For example, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensed the position and use of radioactive material by the Food and Drug Administration authorized the use in investigational trials before they can be marketed. Now, in today's talk, our focus will only be on FDA's role. So as you may already know, FDA oversees the administration of investigational medicinal products. And this includes radiopharmaceuticals. It's no different, whether it's a diagnostic or a therapeutic. And what that really means is that you need to have an IND in place, an IRB approval, before you can start a clinical trial. Now, there are certain exceptions to this rule. However, that is outside the scope of this presentation. So when you're ready to finally submit documentation to the agency, one thing that you should consider is what office and the division of the FDA will have jurisdiction over your product. And the answer really is it depends. So for example, if your product is indicated for the treatment of an oncologic disease, it will be reviewed in the Office of Oncologic Diseases under the relevant division. However, on the other hand, if your products are intended for a diagnostic application, then the Division of Medical Imaging and Radiation Medicine will have jurisdiction over your product. All right, so finally, what about market approval? When it comes to market approval, approval pathways for radiopharmaceuticals are not different than for standard pharmaceuticals. Approval can be obtained via an NDA, BLA, or even an ANDA. So in addition to the 505B1 pathway supporting an application that has full reports of safety and efficacy, what this means is you can gain approval via both the 505B2 and the 505J routes as well. Now, examples of products that were recently approved are the 505B1 and the 505B2 pathways are listed at the bottom of this slide. So let's now briefly look at the regulatory framework that is in place in the EU. So in, e in the EU, radiopharmaceuticals are regulated as medicinal products, and legislation to regulate radiopharmaceuticals as such was introduced in the directives released in 1989 and then also in 2001. However, per the clinical trial directive, which oversees investigational medicinal products, to conduct a clinical trial, you need to get approval from the National Competent Authority and the Ethics Committee in the country where you intend to conduct that trial in. And also keep in mind that although the overarching regulatory framework is set based on the directives that I mentioned earlier, there may be country-specific requirements that can result in heterogeneity and potential development challenges. Stephanie will get into this a little bit later on her section as well. 
What about marketing authorization? When it comes to marketing authorization, sponsors will have several options. Approval for a medicinal product can be obtained by the competent authority of a member state for its own territory. Or sponsors can also seek marketing authorization in more than one member state via the mutual recognition procedure or the decentralized procedure. And finally, sponsors can also seek marketing authorization via the centralized procedure for review by the EMA. And for example, for oncology therapeutics, they will have to go through this centralized procedure. Lutetherase is one example of a recently approved radiopharmaceutical that used this procedure to gain approval. I also want to take a moment to remind everyone that the new clinical trial regulation will replace the clinical trial directive. Although the clinical trial regulation came into force in 2014, the application date is not yet confirmed, but it's thought to be towards the end of this year. Let's now take a look at how the new clinical trial regulation may impact the development of radiopharmaceuticals. So broadly speaking, the new clinical trial regulation is aiming to harmonize clinical trials within the EU. And when it comes to radiopharmaceuticals, the changes will be mostly seen for the diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals. So as I already mentioned, although the regulation will come into effect most likely this year, sponsors will have up to three years for the transition so planning ahead will be critical. Let's take a look at some key points that may change and impact the diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals. First and foremost, manufacturing and import authorization is no longer necessary for diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals that are prepared in accordance to manufacturer's instructions for use in sites taking part in the same clinical trial in the same member state. So that's the first one. Secondly, GMP production, according to Uterlex Volume 4, is not going to be a requirement for diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals. However, keep in mind that they can still be imposed by national regulation. Finally, simplified labeling requirements. So what this means is that it's solving the issue of having to provide too much information on the primary label. So once again, I want to remind everyone that interpretation and application of these changes may depend on the individual member states. So keep that in mind. So now that we have briefly talked about how to initiate a clinical trial and how to market approval, let's talk about some of the specific CMC and non-clinical considerations when you are developing radiopharmaceuticals. Let's start with CMC considerations. So due to the specific biophysical properties of radioisotopes that are used in positron emission tomography, pet drugs are considered as a special category. So in the US, specific GMP requirements are outlined in the Code of Federal Regulations. When it comes to the EU, GMPs for medicinal products for human use are outlined in Uterlex Volume 4, and Annex 3 will contain guidelines for radiopharmaceuticals that also includes the pet drugs. In addition to this, keep in mind that radiopharmaceuticals intended for use in clinical trials should also be produced in accordance with the principles that are outlined in Uterolex Volume 4, Annex 13. One more thing, again, to keep in mind is that stakeholder agencies such as the European Association of Nuclear Medicine have released good radiopharmacy practice guidelines. Now, these are non-binding. However, they might be considered in certain member states. And Stephanie will speak a little bit more about this in her section. Now, what about considerations for non-clinical development? So both US and EU have recently released guidance and guidelines covering various aspects of non-clinical development for radiopharmaceuticals. And these complement what is already available for non-clinical development of pharmaceuticals in general. The most recent guideline from the EMA recognized the need for a targeted approach to evaluate the safety and pharmacology based on what is already known of that radiopharmaceutical, the core component or the non-radioactive component. FDA for the most part is aligning with the EMA and in one of their most recent guidances covered the non-clinical study recommendations for diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals. In fact, the most recent guidance for the radiopharmaceuticals through the FDA that was released just this past August covers non-clinical development of therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals used in oncology. 
So when you take this guidance together, it is evident that EMA and FDA is agreeing that it may be sufficient to conduct toxicology studies in one relevant species given that certain conditions are met. For example, non-radioactive component does not have a pharmacological response at the clinical dose of interest. Similarly, they both seem to agree that given that these medicinal products are well known to cause DNA damage, reproductive studies and carcinogenesis studies can be vetted. However, where US and EU may not see eye to eyes when it comes to GLP requirements. Given the challenges in doing some of these studies, FDA has more recently shown, at least from what we can see in the literature, some flexibility in accepting non-GLP talk studies, but to the best of our knowledge, this is not the case in Europe, at least at this time, a moment in time. One area that is generating a lot of buzz these days is the concept of a theranostic. That is the combination of a targeted therapy with a targeted diagnostic, also referred to as the see and treat approach. Now, a theranostic can be either a single isotope with multiple emitting capacities, such as in the case of Vesitra, or it can be different isotopes that have different emitting capacities, such as in the case of the combination of lutetium-177 with gallium-68. Now, when developing a theranostic pair, sponsors have two parties that they can take, and the FDA has outlined these at the annual conference of the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging that was held last year in Anaheim, California. The two possibilities include co-development, also referred to as the parallel model, or sequential development, also referred to as the in-series model. Each of these will have a specific regulatory consideration. In fact, during the same meeting, FDA informed the attendees to engage in early and frequent interactions with the regulators facilitate a smooth path to registration. So once again, before I hand it over to Stephanie, here are the key takeaway messages from my section as I outlined at the very beginning, and now to talk about considerations when executing clinical trials with radiopharmaceuticals. Here is Stephanie Millen. Thank you, Sanjay. So I'll now speak about operational considerations of clinical trials involving radiopharmaceuticals. Starting with how the regulatory framework, as Sanjay just described, impacts the study startup and planning. Moving on to other factors affecting setup, including CMC and site requirements. Moving into patient recruitment considerations. And finally, data flow and analysis. Next slide, please. So as we've just heard, the regulatory framework for radiopharmaceutical trials is highly heterogeneous. And this is largely attributable to radiation committee reviews. As you can see in the table below, for example, in Spain, no radiation review is required, making the regulatory timelines the same as for any other clinical trial. For Belgium, a radiation board review must be completed before ethics and regulatory submissions, which takes about three months. In the UK, there are two reviews that have to take place. Firstly, a radiation assurance review at least two months before REC submission, plus radiation committee review in parallel with the ethics submission. And finally, in the US, this varies even down to the site level. Some sites have radiation or other committees which must review the trial, which may be required either before or in parallel to IRB submission and can take anywhere between one and six months. So as you can see, this can have significant impacts on study startup timelines. And it's crucial that this is considered when evaluating country and site selection for a study and when planning submission strategies. Next slide. Because of this, for radiopharmaceutical trials, we might consider having more countries with fewer sites per country in order to mitigate the risk of delays owing to regulatory reviews especially given these protocols tend to be much more complex in design. From a regulatory perspective, there are also additional site-specific considerations. Obviously, a site needs a radioactivity license to run a clinical trial, but each separate isotope must be authorized and will also have an associated maximum limit. And that needs to be sufficient to cover all your cycles of IP, accounting for the possibility of multiple patients, as well as any supporting activities such as Im imaging qualification that might require additional radioisotopes to be received. Applications for additional authorizations can take several months, and again, that will impact your startup timelines. And some countries also require specific authorization of your investigator, your site, or both by a radiation committee. And again, that's highly country specific. But importantly, these factors are largely predictable. So with the right knowledge and the right strategy can be managed successfully. And finally, we're seeing that a lot of queries from competent authorities relate to the manufacturing process and how the quality and purity of the final product is guaranteed. So ensuring that sufficient information and detail is captured within essential documents, such as the IB and IMPD, 
will help to mitigate the risk of queries and additional review rounds and extending timelines due to this. Next slide, please. So that leads us nicely onto the supply chain and considerations surrounding different types of radio pharmaceutical IP. And broadly speaking, there are two different supply chains. Some IP is manufactured centrally, and that's generally those with a slightly longer half-life or with specific manufacturing requirements such as a nuclear reactor. They can take several weeks to manufacture, but when complete, have just a few days shelf life in which transportation to a patient must also be completed. So logistics around this are obviously highly important. And alternatively, some products can be supplied as a non-radioactive kit, which is manufactured to order either at a site radio pharmacy or local radio pharmacy. And this is generally those for the shorter half-lives of a few hours, largely consisting of imaging products. Next slide. And in this case of local manufacture, it's crucial that the site radio pharmacy is thoroughly qualified and trained during startup. And this is often performed as a face-to-face -face visit, either from a CMC or QP representative, and should also be used to ensure that the correct documentation is completed for each and every on-site manufacturer. This is also a good opportunity to train sites on exactly what data needs to be input to the ECRS. Each trial will have slightly different data entry requirements, such as whether the quantities are decay corrected or how many modifications to dose are captured should a patient arrive early, for example. And a site understanding of exactly how manufacturing data should be documented is critical both for regulatory and data management. And it's also worth noting that some regions require manufacturing to GMP, whereas others require manufacturing to GRPP. And as Sanjay mentioned, these two standards for manufacture are very different. And although we don't have time now to go into exact details, the important thing to consider is that it can create a need for additional process implementation and validation, and that can add several months to your startup timelines. Next slide, please. So for centrally manufactured compounds, the considerations are very different. Rather than manufactured to demand locally, the dose has to be manufactured to a specific date and time and ordered several weeks in advance, and this has an impact on several processes. And firstly, that's on-site logistics, as the patient visit has to be planned weeks in advance to ensure the patient's not only able to be administered the product at the intended time, but also that all the post-infusion procedures and imaging can also be completed. The second main impact is on the IRT system build as this has to allow the site to request an order for a specific date and time of administration, bearing in mind any manufacturing restriction there might be, and similarly has to allow the manufacturer to return an expiry date and again time. QP release may also be performed by the manufacturer through the system, so the specifications can look very different to what we might see for other studies. And given the short shelf life, Transit is possibly the highest risk within the whole supply chain, as any holdups can result in a missed dosing window and a lost patient. Consequently, it's important to ensure that the correct import and export documents are in place, that any country-specific requirements, such as for packaging, labeling, or notification to authorities are fulfilled, and also that there's backup for any foreseeable issues, such as closures or strikes. And to try and mitigate this, we always perform practice shipments of radioactive material to site, as this allows identification of any customs, transportation, or packaging issues prior to patients being involved. Next slide, please. So now that we've addressed the main considerations for study startup, we can now start looking at our site startup. And this diagram shows a general example of how site setup might look for a theranostic pair trial. And obviously this will vary a lot, but it really shows how complex this process can be. Lots of tasks need to occur in parallel, and many are dependent on others meaning that small delays can quickly escalate into longer ones. So communication and planning between all parties involved is therefore crucial to success, and it's highly important to identify tasks on the critical path and potential risks associated with those in order to mitigate them at the earliest opportunity. Next slide. So once we have our site open, the next step is to enroll patients, and the radio pharmaceutical aspect confers some important differences here. Firstly, how do we find them? And that sounds like a really straightforward question, but the investigator for these studies is often a nuclear medicine physician, which means that the investigator responsible for identifying potential patients might work in a different department. So proactive communication and motivation between these two investigators is absolutely key for identifying patients. And next, once we have our patients identified, how do we make the study attractive for them? Due to some of the manufacturing timelines for therapeutic products, the patient might be unable to receive treatment for some time, perhaps longer than would be expected under standard of care treatment. And this needs to be considered at an early stage during protocol development and supply chain setup 
to parallelize and shorten timelines as much as possible and make the study more attractive to potential patients and their treating physicians. Leading on from that, if the study is for an imaging product, then there's no benefit to the patient at all, and altruistic trials need to be approached and presented in an entirely different way. And really importantly, the concept of radiopharmaceuticals can simply be quite a daunting one for patients who don't have any expert knowledge. The trials are often quite demanding with a lot of procedures and a lot of imaging, but will also have an impact on the patient's home life potentially, such as how close they can be to their family and pets. So we really need to think seriously about how we can support patients, and if there's anything extra we can do to make the study as accessible and as easy for them as possible. And finally, once you have a patient in the study, how do we maximize enrollment? In therapeutic trials, there will be some imaging criteria to be fulfilled to demonstrate the patient expresses the target receptor, but this can be defined in a number of different ways. We can look at quantitative measures, such as tumor to background ratio, a minimum size, or a number of avid lesions, or we can look at criteria such as whether the investigator determines the patient would benefit from treatment. And it's important to discuss at the protocol development stage how stringent this criteria will be, as it's an important balance between having enough eligible patients, ensuring safety of the treated population, and the quality and consistency of the final data. And the last thing to consider is that even if there are multiple eligible patients, due to the heavy scheduling requirements, sites are often unable to treat multiple patients in parallel. Next slide, please. So now that we have eligible patients, how do we manage them? This diagram is again a general example for a screening and day one for a serenostic pair, but demonstrates how complicated patient management can be for these studies. For example, in the first week after a patient is consented, the site might need to organize screening procedures ahead of a screening scan, the screening scan itself for a time at which the radio pharmacy can prepare the imaging product, any additional imaging for the screening, as well as scheduling everything for the day of infusion. So that includes all of your pre and post infusion procedures, any hospitalization that's required, and then working with the radio pharmacy to order the therapeutic product for this date. So you can see it's a lot to manage, often time critical, with a lot of specialist staff and equipment. And it's something that really can't be overlooked because it will have a direct impact on protocol compliance and patient experience, among many other things. And because of this, it's so important to clearly delineate roles and responsibilities and communication pathways up front to ensure this planning is thorough. Support for the site can be extremely valuable here, and our monitors in particular play a crucial role in providing this and ensuring that each patient completes the study successfully. Next slide, please. So once we have patients in and treated, the last main point I'll discuss is data flow. And the diagram on the left broadly demonstrates the different data types we can expect in a radiopharmaceutical trial, with those in green highlight highlighting significant differences to other trials. Firstly, detailed manufacturing and administration data must be captured independently for every single dose. And that might come from a combination of central manufacturer, local radiopharmacy, and nuclear medicine department, and must fully capture the product dose as it decays and is administered, including the potential for any modification to these processes. For example, a reduction in infusion rate during administration due to an infusion-related reaction. And next, there will be a much higher volume of imaging data, as well as any accompanying calibration data, and Alexia will go into more detail on this later. And finally, the radioactivity of blood and urine across multiple time points must also be collected on top of all the normal safety panels. So as you can see, there's a lot more data, and it can come from a large number of different sources. So how information will be transferred from the point of collection through to the ECRS is important to delineate clearly. The quality of data is also an important consideration. Specifically, as for a lot of this data, collection equipment has to be properly calibrated either at the beginning of the study or directly before use. And where possible, the same equipment might be needed throughout the trial. It's vital to know who at the site is responsible for the collection and input of different data values to ensure firstly the training and later on any queries are addressed to the correct person and really secure your highest quality data entry. Next slide. And we also need to consider the turnaround times for data entry as well, as well as those for any cleaning and analysis. For example, is any review required to determine patient eligibility, such as a central read of imaging scans? If so, there needs to be a clearly defined process in place and the site and imaging reader must both adhere to the required timelines. Similarly, for safety review committees or any other committees, the timelines for data entry, image uploads, and any analyses required must be planned up front and communicated to all parties. 
And it's also worth considering that most central labs can't receive radioactive samples, so they have to decay sufficiently at site before being shipped. So it's important, therefore, to consider the stability of the sample versus the expected time for decay to ensure it will still be viable at the time of analysis. And some analyses performed on radiopharmaceutical trial data are simply more time consuming. Dosimetry analyses, for example, which Alexi will talk about in a few seconds, can take several days to complete. And if a single data point is wrong, it may need to be started again from the beginning, so adding on more days to the data turnaround. So how and when data entry and either QC or cleaning will take place should therefore be considered during setup to avoid any unexpected delays. Next slide. So to conclude this section, firstly, the regulatory landscape is highly heterogeneous. Therefore, country and site selection and the corresponding submission strategy is critical to maintain startup and first patient in timelines. The unique CMC requirements for radio pharmaceuticals need to be considered early on in startup, really to ensure the processes are robust throughout the trial. Individual patient management can be highly complex and requires close collaboration from multiple disciplinary teams. And finally, data flow and analysis requirements need to be identified from the outset and adequate processes defined accordingly. And with that, I'll hand over to Alexia Doust, Imaging Project Manager, who will speak about imaging. Thank you, Stephanie. So as Stephanie just said, I will talk about the imaging requirement for radiopharmaceutical trial. Next slide, please. Thank you. So before even uh, starting to scan the first patients on a radiopharmaceutical trial, it is very important to make sure that the scanners are all calibrated. So it is required to obtain a comparable quantification within multicenter settings. It usually uses uh, phantom scans with a source of non-activity. So you have on the right of this slide, you have two images representing a NEMA phantom. For the diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals using PET, the aim of the calibration is to achieve a standardized uptake value harmonization. For therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals using planar, scintigraphy, or SPECT, the aim is to standardize the acquisition parameters, including energy uh, window photopics, for example. This calibration is mandatory for clinical trials with dosimetry calculation, and it is highly recommended for clinical trials uh, requiring SUV calculation. Next slide. About the imaging protocol, it is usually uh, written by the imaging CRO, and it is very important that the site follows very strictly this imaging protocol. There is no deviation permitted. If there is any deviation, then the scan will not be used for any calculation. Um, also, there is no rescan possible uh, for a patient because uh, we cannot uh, allow the patient to be re-injected with the radioisotope. So the site should be uh, should strictly follow the protocol and should be proactive at sending images. As Stephanie mentioned before, timelines are very important. So if within your clinical trials, you have dosimetry calculation that has to be made, then the site has to send the images as soon as possible, as soon as acquired. Um, dosimetry calculation can be used uh, to help the oncologist uh, to, to calculate the treatment dose. So it is usually very time sensitive. Next slide. So it is an example of a diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals. Uh, it is an example of the gallium dotatoc. So the dotatoc is targeting somatostatin receptors uh, that are ever expressed within uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, and the gallium is a PET uh, isotope. So it can be imaged with PET. You can see on the left the, the two different views of a patient PET images. Um, this patient has a metastatic small cell lung carcinoma. So you can see the gallium uptake. Uh, you can see the small black dots within this image that represent the gallium dotatoc uptake. And then you can see the CT scan of this patient. So the CT is used as an anatomical image. And then you can see the overlapping of the two images, the PET and the CT. Next slide. So this is a second example of a diagnostic pair, as mentioned before. So it is an association of a diagnostic and therapeutic radiopharmaceutical. 
I took the example of the gallium PSMA and lutetium PSMA. So the PSMA is an antigen that is overexpressed by prostate cancer cells. Um, so you can see the pair here. On the left, you can see the gallium PSMA PET image of this patient. So this patient is showing multiple bone and lymph nodes metastasis. Um, and then uh, you can see the planar images of the same patient uh, that is going through therapy uh, using lutetium PSMA. Um, so within the, the planar images, what you can see is basically uh, you can see the high uptake within the lesions corresponding to those seen on the PET images. So the quality of the planar um, is lower than the PET, which is normal, but at least uh, it is very interesting to be able to see and image the patient using both the diagnostic and the therapeutic agents. Next slide. Thank you. So this is my last example. It is an example of the dotatate lutetium. Uh, so the dotatate is pretty much the same as the dotatac. It targets somatostatin receptors. And uh, you can see in this example, the images showing primary lesions in a patient with pancreatic gastrinoma. So you can see on the image on the left, uh, the patient image after one cycle therapy with the lutetium dotatate, you can see in red the massive lesion uh, on this patient. And after six cycles of therapy with lutetium dotatate, uh, within the next image, uh, so image F, you can see the decrease of the volume uh, of this lesion. So next slide, please. So I have been talking about planar. Uh, so planar is also called uh, scintigraphy, mostly in Europe. Planar is mostly used in the US. And I have been talking also uh, about SPEC CT. So why should we use planar versus spec CT within clinical trials? And I will focus mostly on the clinical trials uh, requiring dosimetric calculation. So the planar, so it, which is basically a gamma camera in 2D, um, is very convenient for the to scan the whole body. So the whole body scan takes about 30 minutes. It's pretty short, and it allows to scan the whole body. The cons are that uh, for dosimetric calculation, we need usually transmission scans. So the planar is not providing any transmission scan. So we will need to uh, acquire a transmission scan that takes by itself 30 minutes. It is less accurate for dosimetric calculation than spec CT because it's only 2D uh, images. And the total volume of patient's urine has to be collected for dosimetric calculation. Then the spec CT, the cons, oh, yeah, thank you. The cons are that um, the scans take longer than the planar. It's about 15 minutes per field of view, and we'll see it right after how many field of views do we need. So, but usually we we cover mid head to mid eye or head to mid eye. We barely never cover the whole body because it's too long. But the pros are that the CT is providing the transmission scan. It is very accurate for dosimetric calculation because it's 3D images, and there is no need to collect the total volume of patient's urine. Next slide. So about the imaging time points, how many time points do we need to scan uh, the patient after the, the the radioisotope injection. So if we only need to calculate SUV, there is no dosimetry, then only one time point is needed. But if dosimetry calculation has to be uh, done, then between three to five time points is needed. And very importantly, the very early and late time points are the most important ones. So if the site has to skip one of the time points, the site should at least keep the very early and late time points. And scanning a patient at several time points can be very challenging for both the patient and the sites. For the patient, it will depend on the patient's illness and pain because the patient will have to stay about between 30 to one hour, 30 minutes to one hour within the scanner. And the patient may have to come several times to the site. Regarding the site, the site will have to use the same scanner at each time point. And we highly recommend to always use the same image technician. Next slide, please. So going back to the field of use, 
meaning that the body parts that have to be imaged. Um, the images should focus on primary disease as well as on disease extension body parts. If the symmetry has to be calculated, then the images field of view should focus on critical organs, including the full bladder. Um, so you can see on the images, in the, in the image on the right, um, you can see two field of views. So one field of view is represented by a blue rectangle. So you can see here I have represented two field of views. You can see that two field of views can cover the chest, the abdomen and the pelvis. If you want to have the heads as well, if you expect any uptake within the brain, if you expect any lesion within the brain, then the head will be, have to be covered and you will need to, ha to have three field of views. And I, rem I, I remind you that um, it usually takes between 15 to 20 minutes per field of view. So if you have three field of views, then it's, it's a long scan. Next slide. Um, about radiation dosimetry, uh, it is used to estimate the absorbed dose of a radioactive compound within critical organs as well as within tumors if, if needed. It helps to define a treatment dose to treat the cancer but without damaging the critical organs. It can also help to predict a treatment dose based on the diagnostic agent using the same pharmaceutical that was the example that I gave to you uh, using the gallium and the lutetium, for example. If you look at the left graph, uh, these represent the activity curves of uh, different organs. So I just remind you, as uh, Jess has said at the beginning of this webinar, that the activity is expressed in Becquerel. Um, so if you look at the bladder here, we which has the highest activity, around 32 megabecquerel per gram, uh, you can see the decrease of activity um, with time after the injection of the radioisotope. If you look at the right graph, you can see the absorbed dose that is expressed in gray. Uh, you can see that on the very right of this graph, you can see the stomach. The stomach has a high absorbed dose. So in this example, the, the stomach will be the top number one critical organ for this radioisotope. Next slide, please. So this is my conclusion. Um, so the following considerations are very important for any radiopharmaceutical trial. First of all, uh, the scanner's calibration. So the scanner has to be calibrated, all of them. The imaging protocol has to be strictly followed for us to be able to, um, to, to, to quantify the data. The spec CT should be considered instead of planar if dosimetry has to be calculated. The imaging time points have to be defined with dosimetries before protocol finalization. And the field of view has to be include, has to include source organ for dosimetry. And the overall conclusion is that dosimetry calculation is a powerful tool and can help physicians on their clinical decision for treatment dose. Next slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, we will now move to the Q&A se section, so I will hand over to the webinar moderator. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Now, I would like to invite our audience members to continue sending in their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. I've already received some of those questions, so we'll start with those. Our first question here is, what are the most important factors to consider when selecting potential sites? Uh, so this is Stephanie, and the answer to that is that it's really a combination of multiple factors. And firstly, the important thing to forget is not to sacrifice the same things that we would look for in a standard oncology trial. For example, the incidence of disease. You could have the quickest startup and the best site in the world, but that's not helpful if you don't have any patients. So we need to keep all the same factors that we would normally look for. But on top of that, for a radiopharmaceutical trial, we would specifically look at site staff experience, and not just your investigator, but also study coordinator, radiopharmacy, data entry, really everything coming together, and linked to that, the facilities as well. It's a complex protocol, so you really kind of want that experience behind you to try and mitigate the risk of errors and protocol deviations, and ensure that it runs as smoothly as possible. And again, how the site is set up, so how, for example, your nuclear medicine department integrates with your oncology department will look into that. And again, we do also look at startup timelines, as I discussed. Um, obviously, there's a certain amount of risk with additional reviews, 
um, and we do evaluate how long different submissions will take in different sites and countries to also contribute towards site selection. Thank you very much for that answer. Our next question is, which pair of diagnostic and therapeutic are usually used? So this is Alexia, I can answer to this one. Um, so I have a few examples in mind. I have already presented the gallium and the lutetium. So that's the pair with PET and SPECT images. Um, I have also in mind the copper 64 and the copper 67. So copper 64 can be uh, imaged using the PET and the copper 67 can be imaged with SPECT and it's also a therapeutic agent. Um, last example I have is the, the iodine. So we can use iodine-124 um, that can be imaged with the PET and iodine-131 as therapeutic, uh, as therapeutic sorry, uh, that we can image by SPECT. Thank you very much for that answer. Our next question is, should the diagnostic IMP trial be run before the therapeutic IMP trial? If so, why? I can also answer to this one, this is Alexia. Um, so I, I would say that there is no perfect scenario, but ideally it is preferable to run a, the diagnostic trial before the therapeutic trial. Um, so I would say that it's just to make sure that the peptide or the vector binds to the targets um, with a high specificity without toxicity. And also uh, from my experience, we can use the diagnostic agent as an eligibility criteria. Uh, for the, the therapeutic trial. So if you have already developed the diagnostic agent, uh, then we can scan the patient with this diagnostic agent and, um, and make the eligibility based on this scan. Um, also, the, the diagnostic image can be used to calculate the dosimetry uh, and, and calculate an estimate treatment dose for the therapeutic agent. Um, so the choice of the dose uh, for the, the the therapeutic agents will be then based on human derived data and not from non human primate or resident data. Thank you. Thank you very much for those answers. Um, our next question here is Is there specific regulatory guidance available to guide theranostic development? Hi, Mira. Thank you. I'll, I can take that. This is Sanjay, actually. So, as of this point, there is no available guidance specifically addressing the development, co-development of a theranostic pair. Uh, this is where we would highly recommend the pre-end interactions with the agency so that you are gaining alignment with the program. However, what I can say is in 2016, there was a guidance that was released by, a draft guidance that was released by the agency called the Principles for Co-Development of an In Vitro Companion Diagnostic Device as a Therapeutic Product. And some of the same principles perhaps could be used when developing a theranostic pair. Hope that answered the question. Thank you very much for that answer. Our next question is, what are the most common acute and late-term side effects of radiopharmaceuticals? Sure, I can go ahead and answer that question. So there are major series in which patients have been treated with iodine-131. Um, and these patients have been followed for decades. And those series have shown that the side effects and long-term sequela do not really constitute a significant clinical problem. So possible acute side effects include nausea, vomiting, um, radiation sickness, perhaps painful swelling of known metastatic sites, and bone marrow suppression, hematologic toxicity, in the case of treating um, thyroid diseases with iodine-131, patients may acutely experience sialadenitis, which is infection of the salivary glands or a thyroid storm. Potential late effects of radionuclides are hematologic effects, pneumonitis, and lung fibrosis. It's possible that patients could experience fertility disorders or induction of leukemia or secondary neoplasms. Uh, one should note that in practice, late effects are usually measured decades to years after the treatment and are very rarely seen. Um, also, toxicity may be due to the targeting agent rather than to the radiation effect, and that should be kept in mind. And in order to promote the safety of radionuclide therapy and radio 
pharmaceutical therapy, it is important to note the relative low incidence of side effects and long-term effects in comparison to standard chemotherapeutics and external beam radiation therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, our next question here is, what type of items have you put in place when facing recruitment challenges? Uh, this is Stephanie. So the main thing that we really consider with these types of trials is that they're not run at a very large number of centers. Um, and so really what we look to do when we have recruitment challenges is to really broaden really the knowledge of the trials throughout either the country that we are working in or in the specific region. And the reason behind that is that you might only have one or two sites per country. And if you're only recruiting from that particular site, then your patient pool is quite small. What we try and do is work with investigators both at the site and at other sites to try and increase referral networks and increase understanding of the trial amongst different sites in the hope that if they have patients, they then might be able to refer them back to the treating site and also whether we can put any information in the public domain to try and reach patients directly rather than going through the investigators themselves. And linking into that, we can also then try and put in place schemes to maybe make patient transport a bit easier or providing accommodation, really things like that. So understanding that if patients are traveling further to get to your site, you maybe need some additional measures in place to make that journey a bit easier for them as well. So really just trying to broaden the scope of the trial in terms of geographical recruitment. Well, thank you very much for those answers. We've now reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If we were unable to attend to your questions during the Q&A, the team at MedPace may follow up with you afterwards, or if you have any further questions, to direct them to the email address showing on your screens. That's info at medpace.com. Thank you for everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a email follow-up from Xtalks with, with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screens for your participation is appreciated as it will help us improve our webinars. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Jess Garnaschelli, Alexia Doust, Stephanie Millen, Sanjay Gunasekera, and feel free to share the recorded version of this webinar when it becomes available to you using the link in the chat box. We hope you found this an informative conference, and I hope you have a great day, everyone.